Hey everyone, I've spent the last month coming up with this totally original idea, and now it's showtime. <laughs> As a thriller shiller, I really wanted to love this movie, but yikes. I haven't felt such disappointment since I was born. With such an interesting concept, I'm shocked that the film was handled this poorly. Half of the movie is exposition, setting up the monster's rules, yet the rest of the film just ignores them completely. The monsters are strong enough to tip over a full silo, but they can't punch through the tin roof of a car. The family is cautious enough to carefully paint routes around their house that won't cause noise, but they leave a six inch nail standing straight up. And the monsters are sensitive enough to hear a whisper, but they're oblivious to the parents making a baby. Like, why would you even have a child in the apocalypse? Some of these goofs could be explained as realistic character to decisions, but the characters don't have any development, so their motivations are unclear. The first two-thirds of the film were clearly structured to teach the audience who the characters are and explain what they stand for, but for that portion of the movie, there are hardly any challenging situations that reveal the cast's true selves. Instead, A Quiet Place just fiddles around for an hour before it comes to a mediocre conclusion that feels unsatisfactory because the audience doesn't care about the characters or their peril. The admittedly solid premise of A Quiet Place is further diminished by a generic action score that plays over nearly every scene. I would have enjoyed this film if it recognized its camp, but instead tried to play itself seriously. Exposition whiteboard and all. Taking inspiration from A Quiet Place, Host is chock full of wasted potential. Although Host recognizes his B-movie status and occasionally plays off the audience's expectations in a clever way, it often sets up resolutions that never come to be and contributes nothing fresh or interesting to the internet found footage genre. But what Host lacks in originality, it makes up for in basic competence. It understands the common beats the rising action of a movie follows, and it checks through the list of regular requirements as quickly as it can. It's not pretty, but it gets the job done, and with the runtime so terse, there's not much to hate. Years ago, I walked out of The Lion King 2019 and vowed to never watch another live-action Disney remake. The Jungle Book remake was decent fun, but the old mouse quickly realized that the quality of their reinterpretation didn't affect profit so long as the intellectual property was popular, so standards lowered and for the next few years, Disney cursed the world with auto-tuned, out-of-key musicals. In the live-action Lion King movie, they actually auto-corrected Kid Simba to the wrong note here. So when I heard that 101 Dalmatians was the next passenger on this ride to damnation, I thoughtlessly brushed it off until I realized that Craig Gillespie was directing. I, Tanya is one of my top 10 favorite films, so I was excited to see a classic story re-envisioned through this bright, self-aware, and hyper-energetic lens. And for the first 90 minutes of the film, I got exactly what I expected. The movie has fun and interesting production and costume design, Wonder pokes Dog fun at Disney tropes, and moves at a breakneck pace. The height of the film comes at the midpoint with a needle drop of Hush by Kula Shaker. This is the third licensed song the movie plays in a row, and sure, it doesn't fit either the time period or tone of the film, but it led to a, dare I say, transcendent experience. Everything about Cruella is outrageously over the top, and this moment embraces that chaotic nature and informs the audience that it's okay to laugh either with or at the film. Our buddy Craig doesn't care which you choose, he just wants you to have fun. But unfortunately, $100 million are on the line and the mouse hates risk. So after these 90 minutes of a satirical thrill ride, Disney attaches human centipede style an hour of generic dribble that sets up sequels and promotes merchandise. The second part of Cruella is so unremarkable in every way, but it left me especially bitter because of the infectiously entertaining hour and a half that preceded it.
Barb and Star breaks free from the convention of modern comedies building to a serious conclusion and focuses entirely on making its audience laugh. While its humor certainly isn't for everyone, I'd recommend it if you're a silly goose looking for a goofy time. It's just me and my camera and you and your screen. I've never been a fan of Bo Burnham's brand of comedy or philosophy, but I enjoyed this special as much as I possibly could. On a technical level, this film looks like the best version of the quarantine movie every filmmaker tried to make. The production design, even for a two second insert shot, is on the level of a Broadway show. The relentless dedication to do every effect in camera not only demonstrates Bo's love for his craft, but also injects a much needed physicality into the single location film, and the perfectly paced editing is the best I've seen all year, miraculously stringing together every song, bit, and monologue into a coherent feature film. Finally, this special explores the relationship between content and content creator in a methodic and thorough way that I've never quite seen before. Unfortunately, as the film delves into darker and more depressing subjects, I understand what it's going for conceptually, but feel emotionally detached. Even though the special doesn't personally add up to more than the sum of its parts, I still recommend it to anyone who uses social media and wonders how stars manage fame, expectations, and relevance. This film created Twitter... Tw tw Twitter. My favorite part about watching a movie from a different culture is seeing how international film movements address style, tone, and structure. Two years ago, Parasite broke through the language border and introduced millions to the grimy, non-stop tension of the Korean New Wave. Following a historic Best Picture win, Parasite opened the floodgates for many more films from around the world to reach previously isolated mainstream American audiences. Last year, another round introduced hundreds of thousands to Dogum 95, pardon my filthy southern tongue. Dog. Dogum. Dog. 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 Dogum is a movement that focuses on realism as a means to take back power for the directors as artists. New Hollywood was the most similar domestic movement that planned to take back power into the director's hands, but that wave has since crashed, and even at its peak, it did not strive for the same vows of chastity as Dogum. Understandably, the realism of another round was jarring, especially how many relationships are left fringed and many characters have not completed their arc by the conclusion of the film. This outlook is much more depressing than mainstream American movies and addresses the complexities of life in a way that I've never seen before on film. This was the first movie I watched in May and it has continually lingered in my mind for over a month now. I plan to further explore Dogum 95 through additional works by Thomas Vinterberg and co-founder Lars von Trier. <laughs> survive and what will be left of them. This is such a basic yet mystically intriguing tagline for such a horrific film. Last October, I binge-watched over a dozen slasher movies from Psycho to Scream, yet I couldn't bring myself to watch The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I didn't know what the film was about, or even when it was made, but that simple sentence paired with the image of a man wearing a human scalp was enough to make me save the film for another day. Having finally seen the movie, I can gladly report that the poster lived up to its promise. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a terrible terrifying film. While some horror flicks try to scare the audience through musical cues or a high body count, Chainsaw creates fear by tearing away the stability present in the basic formulas of filmmaking. Characters are killed off before their plot is resolved, and the lead character simply switches to whoever remains. This lack of a common structure prevents the audience from predicting what happens next, which forces the viewer to live in the moment with the surviving cast. The most riveting aspect 
aspect of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the camera work. From the beginning of the movie, the camera work is incredibly realistic. The footage is shot on film, grainy, handheld, but relatively steady, kind of reminiscent of a documentary, but when the characters encounter the insane, the cameraman loses his mind as well. A single shot may last for several minutes before a dozen cuts are abruptly placed all within 10 seconds. Spatial continuity and the 180 degree rule sever with the flesh of Leatherface's victims. The camera twists and contorts in unnatural ways, often obscuring the violence, yet hearing screams of terror just out of sight is more haunting than showing the gore ever could be. This is especially apparent during the first kill when our lead is knocked out, bleeding as his body trembles, only for the door to slam in front of the camera as further beating is heard. After the last living protagonist narrowly escapes death, these technical aspects briefly return to normality, and I expected her to bandage her wounds and the film to wrap up, but the Texas Chainsaw Massacre subverted my expectations one final time as she is drugged back to the farmhouse she just escaped. By this time in the film, I was fatigued and ready to watch something lighter, so I felt trapped as our lead being thrown back into mayhem. Individually, these filmmaking guidelines shatter once more in a scene so exhilarating that I can't do it justice in words, and I strongly recommend that you check it out yourself. And cut! I hope you enjoyed watching that video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you didn't, I'd appreciate it if you let me know what you didn't care for so I could learn and improve. But if you did, you can always subscribe for more pretentious ramblings from a delusional individual. I'm going to talk about these films real soon, so be there or be square. This film created twatter. Twitter. God damn it.